we started talking about consequentialism last time. And with that, we started to look at theories that primarily focus on what are the consequences of your actions. And judging those consequences is a way to determine whether you did something right or wrong. That's the morality of it. So John Wesley is famous for this quote. He says, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, in all the times you can, so the people you can as long as you, as long as ever you can. So that sounds overwhelming, but you'll start to see the point of consequentialism and in particular utilitarianism, which we're gonna look at. So utilitarianism, as you can see, it's another consequentialist type of theory. Last week we talked about social contract and we discussed how social contract is based in egoism, in ethical egoism, that I'm willing to make a contract and I'm willing to make some sort of agreement based on the idea that the other party is willing to compromise as well as I'm willing to compromise. So if we make a deal, we're both gonna benefit from this deal. That's the basic idea for a social contract. Utilitarianism, however, on the other hand, is completely coming from a different motivation. They're coming from a motivation of altruism, doing something for somebody else and expecting nothing in return. You're just simply doing to help somebody else and you're not looking for anything to benefit you back. And this is why it's really relevant to what's going on right now for the virus and what everybody's doing is, are we helping others in this situation and not looking for some sort of self-interested benefit? Somehow that we can, you know, capitalize on this. Some people are, some people are taking this situation as a time to maybe, you know, make some money, get some business or whatever. And that would be more of a social contract approach. But there are other peoples who are practicing a utilitarian approach and arguing that instead, perhaps we should help others and just for the sake of helping others. So when we talk about consequentialism, this is a theory that was in part developed by Jeremy Bentham. Bentham is an economist and he's a utilitarian and you'll see why those two kind of go together. So his background in economics is really influential because he's gonna look at helping others as a way as a form of calculation you can i can calculate how well i'm going to help others if i can prove that i'm helping others through the consequences then there should be a way that weigh those numbers out this is what it means by optimistic the best thing to do is an optimistic action so you're basically weighing out the best benefits over drawbacks. So it's a ratio game. What that means then is that they already assume that there are gonna be drawbacks, that it's not gonna necessarily be perfect for everybody. So the realists in that sense, that they're not saying there's gonna always be a perfect answer for every situation. Some people are gonna lose out. Not everybody's gonna come out of this a winner but they're weighing it out as well, what's the best you can do in that situation for everybody involved. So an example that I used all the time in classes uh, when I explained this is that, let's say everybody's doing their taxes, they turn in their taxes, they get a return, say you have an extra $600. So that's not $600 that uh, you need for any necessity or anything like food or rent or anything. This is just an extra, extra $600 that you have. Now, what are your options to do with that $600? Well, one option could be you can donate it to Oxfam, which is a worldwide charity that helps out 
many people in many different countries. Or you can get yourself a new iPhone or something. What should you do? Examine the consequences. If you give the iPhone, then you're happy, but the consequences could be that 10 people die as a result of not getting the money that would have helped them at that moment. Now, if you go the other way and say, well, I'll donate the money, you help those people, but you don't get the iPhone, you're not happy. You just gave your money away. Which, two, which of those two actions would be optimistic? What has the better ratio? The first one. <clears throat> but then how do we know that? Because the how amount can of I... people that you're going to help. But how do I prove that? This is where it's going to get difficult. This is why it's not so easy. There's a system to this. This is why they're economists and they're going to come up with a system of how do you calculate this? So this is the structure of consequentials. And remember this, this is crucial. This is how the whole theory works. To figure out what the best result is in a particular situation, first you're going to have to figure out what has intrinsic value. So this goes all the way back to where we talked about value theory and instrumental goods and intrinsic values. Remember, what, what's the definition of an intrinsic value? Does anybody remember? I forgot. <laughs> Like, why is happiness an intrinsic value? We did talk about this. Right. So, what this is saying is that it inherently has value. It's not given by people. This means that you can't just simply say, well, it's valuable because I think it's valuable. That is an instrumental good. That's an instrumental value. It's an instrumental value, remember, of tools because it helps me, that's why it's valuable. But an intrinsic value is something that has its own value. So remember the hedonists, they were saying happiness is the point of life. Happiness is the only intrinsic value. That's what you should be striving for in life is to attain happiness. Because once you attain happiness, do you need anything else to live a good life? Is anything other remote? No, nothing else is required. You can't go any further than that. So this is what the utilitarian is going to say. They're going to say that happiness is an intrinsic value. This means that utilitarians are hedonist. So if I go back, this is why all these theories are connected back to metaethics. This is why I started with metaethics. Remember, metaethics was arguing, are there real objective values or not? And then we talked about value theory and hedonists saying, well, happiness is an objective value. And utilitarians are hedonists and they're objectivists. They think objectively happiness is the value to live by to judge whether you're doing something right or wrong that should be the basis of morality so for one the first step they're going to say happiness is the only thing that has real intrinsic value that's how we measure good from bad two well then what's the opposite of happiness then What would be intrinsically bad then? What's the opposite of happiness? Sadness. Some people will say misery. So 
notice what's going on here. You're, they're creating a scale to measure good from bad. What is good is happiness. What is bad is misery. They're going to weigh out the scale and see the ratio. That's why this whole thing is about ratios. What benefits means what creates more happiness as a consequence versus the drawback. What creates more misery or sadness as a, res as a result. So then step three comes, and this is where it gets tough. Figure out what actions are available to you in the moment. So you have to take a particular situation, and this is the good part and maybe the bad part. Situations are always different. So, excuse me, you're not gonna get the same answer every single time for every situation. This is why you would have to do the steps for every single situation. You can't just be able to say, well, it always produces more. You never know that for sure. So in the scenario I was talking about right now with the iPhone, what actions did we weigh out? What, were, what was available to us because we got an extra $600? Both more choices. <clears throat> what choices do we have in that moment? So we could donate the money or what? What was our other option? Buy ourselves a phone or something. Right. So, but th this is this is key to it. Do you see? We're going to have to figure out what we can do with that six hundred dollars, right? Yep. That, that's a very individual thing that we have to figure out. Then determine what the value of the results are. So, what would be the consequences for option one? That we buy ourselves a phone or option two that we donate. So what would the consequences be in our scenario, in a very simple scenario? Well, 10 people survive, right? But I lose out on the phone, I'm not happy. The other way is, well, I'm happy, but 10 people lose out, or I'm sorry, and then the way is 10 people are happy, but I lose out. So if you compare those two ratios, what has the better ratio of happiness? What's the optimistic action? From those two choices. Right, helping the 10 people. So do you see though, this is why it's altruistic. Who loses out in that scenario when you donate to help 10 people? Who doesn't benefit directly? Yourself, right? Myself and the people who is making the phone. So, yeah, <laughs> good. This is where you would have to weigh out the consequences. How far do the consequences go and to what degree? This is why it's going to be really much more complex theory than what we've seen before. Now, these five steps, though, remember them. This is how you calculate at the end. And this is the proof. This is why uh, Jeremy Bentham and we're going to talk about John Stuart Mill, who we talked about before with hedonism. I said he comes back later. Here he is again with consequentialism and utilitarianism. They're, they're coming from an economics background. They want numbers, they want proof. You're gonna say that this action is better than that action. This is good and that is bad. Well, then you're gonna have to prove it to me. And they think when you weigh out the consequences, 
in terms of happiness, that's the proof. Like you don't need any further proof than the fact that you help 10 people from suffering and experiencing misery. That is a proof right there. Questions so far? So Mill, remember, he's arguing that happiness, or I think a better word for it, because I, I think when they're talking about happiness, they don't mean necessarily an emotion. We're accustomed to talking about happiness in terms of an emotion that people feel. What remember the heathenists when they talk about happiness, they mean it as a value, as a goal. So maybe a better word to use, I think, is well-being. You're trying to increase and raise people's overall well-being, how well their life is. You're trying to improve other people's lives. So that's why John Stuart Mill, I think I mentioned before, is an early advocate for women's rights and animal rights. Because at the time in England, they don't have rights, neither group. So he says very famously, and his wife is also a really good philosopher as well. And there's some talk about the fact that maybe some of his philosophy is really her philosophy because she couldn't publish as a woman. So what he says in the sub of women in 1869 in England, he says that the principle which regulates the existing social relations between the two sexes, the legal subordination of one sex to the other is wrong itself. And now one of the chief hindrances to human improvement. Notice what he's saying there, that this principle which determines how we relate in society between men and, uh, men and women of one sex, of male and female, is wrong in itself. And who does it hurt that we treat these two sexes differently, male and females? So remember at the time, women can't own property. They're not allowed to vote and they're not allowed to own property. Who is this hurting, according to Mill? It hurts everybody, exactly. Notice what he says at the end. Hinders to human improvement, not to hinders women or females or just hinders one group or he says this hurts everybody because if women cannot own property then that means that they have to live with some male figure a father a husband or somebody right if they're abused or they get kicked out where do they have to go in those little circumstances What are their options to survive? They don't have a place to go. Because remember, they can't own property. They can't get an apartment. They can't own a house or save up. There's nowhere to go. This is what happened in England at the time, and this is why it's John Stuart Mill's focus on this. If you have the women on the street, and of course, where do the children go? Okay. They are with their, with their mothers, right? They're on the street as well. So to get by and survive on the street, what are they going to have to do? This was a huge problem for people in England at the time. If you're a kid on the street, no, this is not where we have public school and everybody gets to go to school. This is before that. So if you're a kid on the street and you're trying to survive with your mom, what are you going to do to get by?
yeah, you're going to steal. This is why all those stories about uh, Scrooge, uh, all those stories by Charles Dickens, these are all stories of like kids out on the street pickpocketing and stealing from people to get by because that's all they have. And you notice who they're stealing from, right? Rich men. So you see, in the end, the consequences are it hurts everybody. All the society is held back because they're going to treat one sex different from another. They're going to make it that a law, and those laws are going to hurt everybody. So this is why Mayo was saying, this is what's wrong the consequences for everybody, you're making everybody's life miserable as a result. Does that make sense so far? Questions? Got to give me some feedback. Just want to make sure everybody's following along. Okay. So what Mill is going to say then, as a utilitarian, instead of basing our principles on ideas that uh, males are better than females or something like that, and then remember I said the law is always a reflection of the ethics. So instead of having our ethics based on those kind of ideas, he's proposing the principle of utility. That's the principle we should live by. An action is morally required just because it does more to improve overall well-being than any other action you could have done in circumstances. Notice, it to improve, right, overall well-being, not to improve one group's overall well-being versus another group. It's a overall. So there's no, they're not making distinctions about who's important and who's not. This is what also includes animals as well. This is why a lot of utilitarians are animal rights activists as well, because they're saying, how can you justify killing five cows for two people? How can you justify when the ratio is five to two? Think about when you go to the grocery store right now, and you're fighting for toilet paper. Like, if you go into the meat aisle, the food aisle, right? the, um, how much meat, and I get, I've seen them with my own eyes, how much meat they throw away that they don't sell. So if you've seen uh, El Paso, El Paso Fighting Hunger, is a local nonprofit organization, and they're donating a lot of, of, they get, what they do is they get a lot of companies like Walmart, Target and stuff that, to donate food, but they can't really give people the meat because meat goes bad so quickly. So they have to throw away entire steaks, huge, uh, ham, turkey, everything just goes right in the dumpster. And so those, all those animals die for apparently no reason. This is why utilitarian saying you can't really justify that on a moral grounds that that is a legit thing to do, to create that much suffering so you can make some money. So this is why Mill is an animal rights supporter and a women's rights supporter in the 1800s in England, when everybody thought that was crazy. Because he sees that it's not who it hurts, but the fact that it hurts somebody. The fact that you're creating more misery is the issue. So, Usually they say the greatest good for the greatest number. But I want to clarify, and Sheffield Lionel does this in the book. There doesn't mean 
when you try to do the greatest good for the greatest number, that you always benefit the majority. This is not a gross democracy where you just go with what everybody else wants to do. So just because you can help more people, the example I think in the book is you can help 90% of the population, let's say, the government can, which is happening right now, which is kind of ironic, right? We're all waiting for this stimulus check, right? So if you give everybody $1,200 versus, let's say you take that same amount of money that they're going to give most people $1,200, you put it all together and you help instead people who are homeless and starving, what would do the more good in the long run? Right, why would it be helping the homeless and the starving? Why would be that why would that be better consequences in the long run? Any ideas? Why would that end up being the best thing? Why not giving everybody twelve hundred dollars be better? What is everybody gonna do with the twelve hundred dollars? Don't tell me you guys haven't thought about it. <laughs> what are you gonna do with the twelve hundred dollars? <throat> Anybody have plans for those twelve hundred dollars? Pay my bills. <laughs> yeah, you can pay your bills. And that'll work for a little bit. But is that going to help you next year? Not at all. Not really in the long run. But if you take all that money that they're going to give us and you say instead, what I'm going to do, what we're going to do here as, as a country is that we're going to make houses like temporary housing for homeless people so they have somewhere to live and until they can get a job and things like that and get a place of their own, which people do already. There are organizations that they make a uh, small like apartment buildings and it's a place for homeless people to get on their feet because if you're homeless and people People can be really cruel. When when people are homeless, they say, oh, well, you should just get a job. The problem with that is that if you apply for a job, what do you need to put on your application? What's going to be really helpful? A home address, right? You're going to have to put some address, and how are they going to get a hold of you? What else do you need? A phone, right? Oh. How are, if you're homeless on the street, how are you going to get a phone and a home address to get a job? You see, it's kind of your in the Cash 22. It's like to get a job, you need a place. But to get a place, you need a job, right? So these organizations thought, well, why don't we give them a place with a phone for a couple of months? They can shower. They can get clean and they can find a job and they have that time period. They get a chance. This is why, yes, I would say that uh, people unfortunately judge a lot of homeless people and say, oh, well, it's their fault or whatever. It's like, not really. Not in all cases, it doesn't. And it's really tough to get out of it once you're in it. I think a lot of us enjoy a certain level of privilege. 
because if let's say we like a lot of what happened to a lot of us right now if you lose your job maybe your family your extended family will help you out for a little bit but if you don't have that if you're on just completely on your own then you know, So it doesn't mean always helping the majority. It means what's going to help better in the long run. And it doesn't mean whatever creates more happiness. So this is also a difference between the net worth of something and the total worth. Because what is it, what's the difference between the net versus the total worth? You guys should know this very well if you have to work. Do you get to take home all the money you earn? No. So the and total the taxes and stuff. So the total money is all the money you earn. <clears throat> what you actually take home is the net. You take all the money you earn minus the taxes and everything else, right? That's your net worth. So what they're saying, this is why I said they're economists. <clears throat> they're saying to do the same thing with happiness and misery as well. You take all the happiness, but you also have to weigh that out with the misery. So that's what I was saying about the animal uh, rights and issues of uh, vegetarianism, is that if you kill what they do with factory farming, if you kill you know thousands of pigs but it only feeds like half or less than half and you end up throwing all that meat away you see even though you're feeding these people it doesn't justify it because you still are creating more misery as a result so this is where it goes into consumer ethics as well. What you buy, where you buy things, who does it affect in the long run? You have to think about that. How much misery is produced so you can get some product? Like right now I'm drinking coffee. But where do the coffee beans come from? Has anybody thought about that? Where did we get our coffee beans from, usually? Nobody thought about it? Am I the only one who drinks coffee? We usually get it from some other country, right? So, South American countries and African countries are usually the countries that grow coffee beans, right? If you're a coffee drinker, you know, you're looking for those kind of beans. But somebody has to grow the coffee beans, right? Somebody has to harvest them and do all that work. Are they getting paid what they should be getting paid? <laughs> Not everybody is. So do you see, and this is what's going on, I would say, right, there are a lot of documentaries out there. I would say, actually, this is what's going on right now. I think, I think we mentioned this last week as well. The group, I think, is that one of the groups that is suffering the greatest right now is migrant workers who are working in fields picking our food so we can eat. But you see how they're at huge risk being out there together picking for getting the virus so that they can feed us. And they get paid very, very little. But we depend on them.
So this is why Mill, again, would probably say that the ratio isn't there to create that much misery from these people so you can benefit some people. But every situation is different. So I want to make sure I cover everything because I'm going to have to end this because it'll time us out. So I want to make sure uh, we get this done before 12. Um, for ethical monism, that means that a theory has one rule to live by. We saw that with the divine command theory that obey God's command. That was the one rule. Uh, Egoism was maximize self-interest. And remember with Hobbes, social contract, you do that, you, that's why you have contracts, because it's going to help you. But utilitarians are going to argue maximize happiness overall. That's why they do the ratios. The same. That's why they're altruistic. That's why when I buy coffee, I look for coffee that's free trade, or fair trade, I'm sorry. Fair trade coffee is a system in place and this is totally volunteer companies don't have to do this but if you see a label that says fair trade you know the people who down the line brew the coffee pick the coffee all those they got paid what they should be getting paid that means though that that coffee is going to be a little bit more expensive than the other coffees but i can trust to some extent that those people were not being abused and that they were getting paid fairly. So for a utilitarian perspective, the right thing to do then, what you can do when you go shopping, is look for those kind of labels because then you're helping in a greater sense with better consequences. Because if nobody's buying the fair trade coffee, then they're going to stop selling it, right? That's the way the market works. If there's no demand, then they're going to stop the supply. So with utilitarians and with a lot of uh, ethical monistic theories, they have to be absolute. These rules, you can't break the rule because then that would break morality. And that they're fundamental. That it doesn't go any deeper than this rule. Like this is the foundation. How they differ is who they're focused on. The divine command theory we talked about was only about whether you obey God or not. Like had nothing to do with you. It's whatever God wanted. Egoism is about just helping yourself. But utilitarianism is about maximizing happiness overall. That means that you have to be willing to sacrifice if it helps others more, which is a tough thing for people to do. But I think that's maybe what we can think about right now with migrant workers, with people in the medical field. They're putting themselves at risk to help others. So that's something to think about, I think, right now. So Mill says here, benevolence should be our guiding aim and the life of altruism and good work should be the record we leave behind. So that's what should guide us in life, is to help others. And that's what we should do. That should be the consequences of our life, is that people remember us for helping others. And it's not for our own benefit, because we'll be dead. It doesn't matter for us. Like, what matters is that you help other people. So, now, I want to skip ahead a little bit. This is the whole thing about vaccines. And this is the whole thing uh, I was going to talk about in class is that, remember, wearing the mask, wearing gloves, protective gear, is not so much... To protect you, it's to protect other people, right? The mask, that's primarily the main, from what I understand, the main purpose of the mask is that if you're infected, you're not spreading it around. 
This is why we're asked right now to stay away and not interact with uh, older people who are more at risk of dying from the virus and younger children, babies and things like that. Right, so we have to be willing to sacrifice things, rights, our own rights of what we can do and where we can go in order to make sure that we protect others. That's what utilitarianism is about. So we can, this is why I think like they have a, uh, I've seen on social media and stuff, people going out and partying and all that. Uh, they're not utilitarians for sure. They're egoists, I think. I think they're, or not even egoists, I would think they're just selfish. In that they are not thinking about the consequences, they're only thinking about what's good at that moment, and they're not trying to do things to help others. Right, so the, there are cases uh, where they try to see that where the virus is spreading in El Paso can be linked back to somebody having a party or something. You see, it's only their benefit. They're only thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about long-term consequences and the health of others. And as a utilitarian, this is why I think, uh, for the most part, I would say the medical field are trained to be utilitarians. Maybe they don't use that word, maybe they don't tell you, but you're trained to help others. And you have to be willing to sacrifice yourself sometimes in order to do that. So if anybody is going into the medical field, they're working, they're studying to be a nurse, doctor, whatever, that is your morality in some sense is a utilitarian approach to everything. So this is what we need to think about in regards to the virus. Now, for utilitarians, this is, I'm gonna go here. The benefit to being a utilitarian is that it's impartial. This is, notice when, you're, when it says you should help others, it doesn't say you judge them based on race, sex, religion, or whatever. You help, if they're affected by it, if they could be infected by the virus, you have to think about them. It doesn't matter if you know them or not or they're your friend or not, that's not what's important. And it does justify conventional moral wisdom, saying that things that we normally would assume are just wrong, rape, slavery, killing innocent people, utilitarians have an answer for that. They're saying, why those things are wrong? Because of consequences. Just look at the consequences and how much misery you're causing. And how do you determine whether you should do one thing or the other if you have some sort of conflict. Let's say you're not sure whether to tell the truth or not in a situation. You weigh out the consequences. What has better consequences for, for yourself and for others? That's why they're flexible. This is why it's really kind of complicated. For utilitarians, there's no absolute rules other than maximizing happiness. So. If that means that you have to sacrifice some people or the group, and I think this is a big discussion right now with the virus, you're going to have to do that. If you're in the medical field and you have to put yourself in danger to help others, you have to be willing to do that. It depends on the scenario and the situation and the consequences. That's why everybody's included, including animals, for utilitarians. If it, animals can suffer, if it can suffer, then you have to put them in the calculation as well. Now, there are problems though. And I think this was a good example uh, that I normally use in class, before we start talking about uh, the virus right now, there, I was 
you could see this with the Ebola virus as well. This is what exactly they're talking about, is that the way, pe some people don't understand this, the way viruses spread is exponential. Remember, exponential growth is not the same thing as adding. You can add how many people get infected. It's gonna spread by, if I infect two people, then those two people are gonna infect two other people, and you see it's gonna, it starts off very slow, but it's gonna blow up, and that's what they mean by flattening the curve, is that they're trying to prevent it from just shooting up exponentially that we're trying to to limit that and that's exactly what they were doing here with the Ebola virus is that they were trying to judge you see the dotted lines if they didn't do anything that's the darker dotted line that's how many people would die in a month or so if they started taking precautions and measures, then they were trying to think about it in terms of the lighter dotted line. So they're comparing what's going to happen is around 15 or 16,000 people going to die versus about seven, 75, uh, 750. What is the better option here? But notice people are going to die. And unfortunately, that's the reality of it. So this is why right now we're dealing with people are still going to die even if we flatten the curve. Not everybody's going to get out of this. That's just the basic truth. But can we do something to make the situation better? That's what matters. And that's what a utilitarian will do. Now, of course, there's a bunch of problems with utilitarianism. Uh, what I want to skip to, though, to make sure that uh, people understand two things. If you're utilitarian and you're saying that it's important to increase happiness overall and do the right thing, that might mean that you violate people's rights to do that. So maybe I have the right to walk and go anywhere I please. But if it's about a public health thing, you're going to have to limit people's rights. This is what's going on with the lockdown and all that, is that they're going to hold back people's rights to go to the park, to go to have gatherings, to get together in order for benefit of everybody. So you lose rights, but you're willing to lose those rights because you are looking out for the overall well-being of the group. Does that make sense to everybody? But some people won't like that, as you can see. Some people are gonna say, wait a minute, how can I lose my rights, give up my rights, if it's these other strangers that I don't even know? The last thing, and this is what we're gonna talk about as well for next week, we talk about the ontology in Kant, is that intentions are also important. So utilitarians are only thinking about the consequences of the action, what's gonna happen. But they, we haven't talked about the intentions. So you might be able to help somebody, but maybe that wasn't your intention. Utilitarians will say, that's fine. But I would say that sometimes intentions are really important. Did you really intend to help somebody or just by accident you help somebody? It's not the same thing. So we're gonna talk about intentions. And the one that I used to use a lot is Trump. I mean, he's always an easy example. Whether what he did with the election or whatever was, did he know about it, what was going on or not? Would it change the results? Maybe not. But I think we would say that, you know, whether he knew what was going on or not is still important. What were his real intentions? And that's, I think, why we get into politics a lot as well, is that 
what are the real intentions behind the government right now and the people in charge matter, not just the consequences. So I think that's it for today. Any final questions? Everybody's good? Mm -hmm. All right. So then I'll save this and I'll set it up and I'll post it on uh, online. All right. So okay. uh, just to confirm, uh, so we're just going to have uh, one class per week, right? More yeah. Week. All right. Yeah, I think it's that's all we really need. And since I'm going to load it up on online, you can always go back to the to the lecture. Oh, uh, and also, um, I was looking for the activities for the Tehana password, and there some of them says that we have to look through uh, under activity stream on 